Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Nahum, counselor, compassion is what the word really means, compassionate counselor. I like to put them together because of the fact that as we noted in uh, verse 11 of uh, chapter 1, a wicked counselor is coming. That means Satan as Antichrist. Uh, there might be some that would um, dispute that, but the scripture documents it, the fact that it's the one that perishes, and there's only one that's already been sentenced to perish, and that's Satan, son of perdition. Perdition meaning same in the Hebrew tongue. So, I'm sorry, I will apologize, meaning the same in the Greek tongue as Apollyon. Okay, here we go with um, the completion of this book of Nahum. Remember, it's God allowed Jonah to go to Nineveh and bring salvation to them. They accepted and really worshiped God to the last person. And God repented of destroying Nineveh. But here about 60 years later, I mean, they lost it all. Jonah would have been real pleased because, you know, he stood out at the edge and, and no doubt prayed they would fall short. And um, so uh, here God is going to destroy Nineveh, that is to say the capital of Assyria, meaning the Assyrian nation. So uh, we kind of start a new thought. God has described Nineveh as a big pool of water, but all of a sudden she is drained, not a nothing. She's got nothing there to offer. And then in verse 11 of uh, chapter 2, let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father and let's go with it. Where is the dwelling of uh, the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion, even the old lion from a long time back, walked and the lions wept and none made them afraid. Now, this is to, I think I'll take a moment on this and show you that God doesn't forget a threat. Because you see, Sennacherib, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 18, we're going we're to go there, and I want to show you how God answers uh, this particular threat. And we go to 2 Kings chapter 18, 17, 18. 30, let's, let's, just let me start reading with 33. You're not going to have it on your screen, but just listen or you can turn there, whichever. I'll say again, this is what God is answering about. Where is that tough old lion? Used to roar a lot and do a lot of hunting. This is why God said this. He didn't like what was said by this same person who would say in verse 33 of uh, 2 Kings 18, Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? I mean, you looking at the man. This is what Sennacherib said. I'm the king of Assyria. There is nobody and nobody's God can keep anybody from being delivered into my hand. All right? Pretty big talk. God didn't like it. 34 of that same chapter. Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arphad and of the gods of uh, Seraphim, uh, Hena and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hands? That's the ten tribes, beloved. No, God didn't deliver the ten tribes out of his hand. He took them. But he had his eyes open. Verse 35, who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand. That stung our father. And that's why God is saying here, he's answering that. He said, where is that old lion? The old scarred up rascal. You know, because God is going to thump their gourd good. They're going to find out that as much as they converted and worshiped God, now they're going to find out that God's going to deliver their country to whomever he chooses, that he is able. So take strength from that. 
especially when you consider that this king of Assyria is symbolic of the Antichrist in the future is sense. Isaiah chapter 14, documenting companion Bible for a backup on it. Verse 12, back in chapter 2, book of Nahum, God continuing his taunt at Sennacherib. Verse 12, the lion did tear in pieces enough for his whips and strangle for his lioness and filled his holes with prey and uh, his dens with, um, with uh, raven. I mean, he, he just plundered, tore, ripped, and shook, and bellered, and bragged, and God says, where is he? Verse 13, behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour thy young lions, and I will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messengers shall no more be heard the voice of your ambassadors, your ministers. Now bear in mind, the Assyrian here is also a type of Babylon, both just bellied right up to the bar there together, Babylon and Assyria. And what God is saying, I'm going to cut off that false preaching. There's a day coming. You're not going to send any ambassadors out to, with your wicked counseling. Now I want to bring this back to counseling because that's what it consists of in the futurist sense. That is to say in prophecy, and that's very important to you because it's talking about today. There is a time he's going to cut them off. I mean, you know, you take a good, bold teacher does a lot of cutting and sorting right now, and it, it really does. He's not going to, I guarantee you, he's not going to win any popularity contest when he, he really cuts down the false ministers. But it's time, and ultimately, God will end it when they come up to him saying, no, I've led my whole church to you, Lord. We just healed in your name. We cast out demons in your name. And Jesus says what? As it is written out of my sight. I never knew you. Never. You got to know which Christ it is you're serving from God's word, not man's traditions. Chapter 3 and verse 1, you can see that our father is able to answer for himself and he's not gentle in doing so as uh, you just uh, absorbed. Verse 1 of this chapter 3 reads, Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery the prey departeth not. In other words, um, the d lies, the deception uh, that would surmount there naturally, and you must remember this is the city and the country which would take the ten tribes captive. And God utilized them to scatter those tribes around the world as he stated he would, and so they are today. I'm not talking about the house of Judah, but the house of Israel. Verse 2. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. Now, what, what, why would he say the noise of the whip? I mean, when, you, when, when they're close enough, you can hear them whipping the horses. They're coming in for the charge. Do you understand what it, it means uh, that uh, time is of essence? It's happening. They're close enough. They're whipping up those horses to make that final attack, all right, it's that soon, verse 3, the horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their corpse, they stumble upon their corpses. What is that in the future sense? Have you ever read Ezekiel chapter 37? A whole valley of dry bones out there, deader than a hammer, spiritually. And it's real sad when you look in that whole valley of the house of Israel, Ezekiel 37. And do you know what it took from God to bring them back to life? You, you're, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, you're going to be surprised. Because God told Ezekiel, preach to them, but preach the truth. Prophesy my word to them. Because the corpse were spiritual corpse, dead and death, because of the lies back from the, uh, from the uh, leaders of uh, traditions. And when Ezekiel began to preach to them, to prophesy, both the same, 
bone came to bone, hip bone to this bone to that bone, and God said to Ezekiel, what do you see out there? And Ezekiel said, I, I see them coming back to life. And what did God tell him to do then? Prophesy to them some more. Teach those rascals the truth. Uh, and the truth gives life, eternal life, when it's taught. So even though he, God's truth sometimes might cut a little on some people, don't worry about it and never apologize. It'll heal over fine. And they'll be far better off for it, for hearing God's truth. That's, that's what these corpses are in the future sense. So don't expect, uh, don't expect a bloodbath in the end times, but a, a, um, you will see a camp meeting that's the biggest the world has ever had, helped by Satan. I mean, we're going to have a revival. And people are expecting just the opposite, Satan with horns and a pitchfork, and here this beautiful creature that is the spurious Messiah, the son of perdition, stands in Jerusalem claiming to be Jesus, come to fly him out. And they're going to jump on his wagon in mass. Why? Because they're loaded and locked for it. That's what they've been taught. Need I say more? And again, just making friends here and influencing people, but truth is truth. That's the way it's going to happen. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and especially 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 documents what I just stated. Verse 4. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistresses of witchcraft, sorcerers, all right, that selleth nations through her whoredoms. What kind of harlot is it that sells nations? There's only one. And families through her witchcrafts. There's only one this will fit. And, and I hope that you don't even need any prompting identifying her because she's the great, the... Uh, well-favored one of the great book of Revelations that sits as Mystery Babylon, the harlot of harlots. And um, she cries out, I'm not a widow, I'm a queen, as she rules with Satan. Religion, that's what Mystery Babylon is, is uh, the greatest uh, revival ever held by a, 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 a false teacher because it's not really whoredoms that she practiced, but idolatry. That is to say, putting the false Messiah before the true Messiah because of the ignorance of the people. Biblical illiteracy um, running amok through the nation and people not realizing, thinking they're doing a good thing. It is for this reason that mothers deliver daughters to death and vice versa, as we covered in one of the prophets just before this because they think it is Jesus, and they want him to save their children. There's just one thing. He's the fake. That's all right. It's written that it'll happen that way, so it will. Again, Mark 13. Verse 5, as we continue, chapter 3, Nahum, compassion. Boy, I hope you've got lots of it. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face. And I will show the nations thy nakedness, and the king and the kingdoms thy shame. Do you know what this term means? It means caught in the act. Do you know what this nakedness is? Biblically speaking, you will read of it in the 19th chapter of the great book of Revelation, whereby your in verse 7 and 8, whereby your righteous acts form the the weave of the fine linen, white linen, that you wear at this time. You don't have any righteous acts. You're naked, just like described here. You're caught, honey. I'm sorry. That goes for both male and female. There's no gender involved here. Those that are fooled by the false Messiah will suffer shame when Christ said, get out of my face. That's kind of what he said. He said, I never knew you. Away. 
I think he kind of told them to go to the pit, mean go to hell, okay? Because that's where they're headed if they don't get together real quick, six. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee a, a vile and will set thee as a gazing stock, ashamed, naked, and disgraced. Can you imagine some church, the biggest one in town, where they've all fled themselves and laid themselves down for the false Christ, thinking he was Jesus, come to rapture them out? How are they going to take that? I can tell you it's written, I already know from the book of Revelation. Because they really want to do right. It's just that they're a little lazy in their homework, study of God's Word. They've been listening to man too long. As it's written in chapter 9 of the great book of Revelation, at the fifth trump, as the sixth comes on, appearance of, they're going to pray for the mountains to fall on them, to just, just dissipate their souls because they're too ashamed to face the true Christ when they see what they've done how they messed up, thought they had a seat in eternity and find out they're hell-bent for you know where. All they got to do is change, verse 7. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? When shall I seek comforters for her, for thee? Oh, woe be to that great city. Well, thank God she's gone, all right? Uh, it's going to happen, and the same thing will happen to Babylon. This is why the two create a marriage for Satan's platform in the end times. I hope you're not on the platform with him. Verse 8, listen carefully. Art thou better than... Populous no, that was situate among the rivers, that's to say the Nile, right there where the little old Nile River runs, that had the waters round about it. Man, I mean, she could protect herself from any army. You think you're better than she is? Whose rampart was the sea and her wall was from the sea? She had it made until God destroyed her, all right? Um, there is uh, your companion Bibles. You are very fortunate because you can read the side column concerning populace. No, it's, it's, it's not Hebrew. It isn't in, let me translate it from Egypt for it is an Egyptian word. Um, a nun, which is to say, a man rather, which is to say God, and nu is city. God city. Only he's not your God. Who do you think you are, God city? Uh-uh, devil city. Now, please understand what I'm saying. This is not talking about uh, populous no, which is a city still of this day, but uh, it's talking about Satan city, all right? The claim to be God, the Antichrist does, but he's not. Verse 9. Continuing with nations. Hey, wouldn't hurt to listen, friend. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lubin, that's Libya, were thy helpers. This is the dwellers of Africa and the mercenaries of Tyre and so on and so forth that would help out. Verse 10. Yet was she carried away, she went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets. And they cast lots for her honorable men, made slaves out of them. And all her great men, the leaders, were bound in chains. All right? It doesn't, you never want to fight God, because I guarantee you, you're going to lose. And after all, he is the commander-in-chief of, of the universe. He is our father. And it is far better when he treats you like a child rather than an enemy. Because if you're his enemy, you haven't got a prayer. You're doomed. So 
I, I find it difficult in my mind to um, understand how anyone, anyone could uh, want to please anyone more so than our Father. Now this event happened 51 years before the fact. Uh, will it do that in, in uh, our modern day futuristic sense? It probably did. I'm not going to go into it and call names or, or write history, but be that as it may. Verse 11. Thou also shalt be drunken, thou shalt be hid, thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. Be hid, they're going to disappear. Verse 12. All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees. Now listen to this carefully. Like fig trees with the first ripe figs, if they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. What he's saying here, so that you understand the horticulture of a fig tree, is this. The first ripe fruit, when the little hole in the bottom of it's the fig is, a, is really a flowering plant, but the flowers are inside the fig, and there's a little hole in the bottom of it that the little wasp goes into to uh, take of the nectar, and they just drip out a sweet honey, and if you walk up and kick that tree, I mean, it's just plump, and then they just splatter. I mean, they're ripe. I mean, they're, the honey just splatter. He said, that's what's going to, he said, all I'm going to have to do to take you is to go over and kick the wall, and you're going to plump. I mean, he paints a real nice picture there, if you would. Uh, in other words, they haven't got a prayer of a chance. Their stronghold is so fragile, it's like an overripe fig when it hits the ground, when somebody shakes the tree. That's pretty easy pickings for that old warrior. Again, like I stated from 2 Kings uh, chapter 18 there, it doesn't pay to make threats against God. He'll get you, all right? And he's not looking for people to zap. It's just that he takes very personal insults toward him. Verse, uh, even those in ignorance. Verse 13. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Now, I'm going to tell you what. I could take you back to a little bit of time in Celt history where women went to war with men and swung a battle axe just about as good as they did. I mean, they, they, they weren't, um, they were real women of God. So I would hate to have, have one of them here because what it means is, is all your major soldiers are weak as women. Well, you better not stir a bunch of women up or you'll find out that it's not a saying that'll hold true. I'm talking about real women now, all right? Um, uh, verse 14. Draw thee waters from for the siege. In other words, you better fill everything up. Fortify thy strongholds. Make it double strong. Go into clay and tread the mortar Make strong the brick kill. In other words, uh, you better get ready. Is it going to do him any good? Not a speck. When God is your enemy, you don't have a prayer. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Verse 15. There shall the fire devour thee. You see, our Father is a consuming fire. Last verse, Hebrews chapter 12. I'll document it for you. Other places as well. The sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Now sharpen up for me because you're going you're gonna to be, you're going in the future sense, there, he's, God is going to identify his enemies for you. You know what the canker worm is? It's one stage of the locust, all right? Make thyself many as the canker worm. Make thyself many as the locust, all right? So, um, it doesn't matter. Have all the people in the world that are converted to your way of thinking, Satan. It's not going to make any difference. How many will fly away on his wagon thinking it's Jesus? Well, he says, get as many of them as you can. What a day of separating that's going to be when this beautiful one looks exactly like the pictures 
that people hang on their wall of Jesus shows up in Jerusalem saying, the Lord has returned and I've come to fly you away. And they've never read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 with understanding to know where Paul said, listen to me, let me warn you before we gather, gather back to the true Christ, the false one, the son of perdition, is going to stand in Jerusalem claiming to be God, to fly you out of here. They don't care. They like to insert, though there's no article, and, and it would be a poor, sorry linguist that would try to insert the Holy Spirit. But they do. I guess I just called them names, didn't I? Ooh, God will be pleased. Because this is the way people are deceived when they take the simplicity in which Christ taught through Paul and others and twist it, whereby it deceives innocent people that are biblically illiterate. Get them all you can. Multiply it. Get a big wad of them. He will. Don't worry. Doesn't matter. God's got the victory. 16. It's too bad when you think of would-be Christians being enemies of God, isn't it? But they place themselves in that position in harm's ways because of ignorance. 16. Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. Fly with me. This is our escape. Jump on the wagon. I don't know. You know, God makes it so simple, and he must have a sense of humor. Because when I look at the world today and know that beautiful truths such as this are written in the minor prophets, which are like reading tomorrow's newspaper, God even teaches us like he would children. He says, look, look. At least look what happened at Nineveh. That's what I'm going to do then. I mean, a child can understand what happened at Nineveh. Do you think for one moment that the people turned into canker worms and locusts at Nineveh? Don't be a fool. This has reference to Revelation chapter 9. It's prophecy. That's why these are called the minor prophets. Not minor of importance, but because they're short. Don't fly with them. Put on the gospel armor and stand and fight against the fiery darts of Satan, for you do not fight against the flesh arm, but principalities from high places, meaning Satan himself and his little fallen angels and his false preachers, teachers, and flieth away. Be careful, friend. 17. They cr thy crowned, that's royalty, priesthood royalty, are as the locust. Do you remember the breastplate and the crown that the locust put on in Revelation chapter 9? That doesn't ring your bell. If it doesn't, your bell can't be rung with truth. You're so steeped in traditions of men. And thy captains as the great grasshoppers the grasshopper is a part of the locust family, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun ariseth, they flee away. Going to fly away. They warm up and get with it. And their place is not known where they are. The pickings are good. They're just about everywhere in false religion. Warm the place up. Play, some, play another music. Do something religious like passing the plate, will you, real quick, while the people's hearts are tender. Make them all bow their heads like they're ashamed of something and stand up for the Lord. There's nothing hidden that shall not be made in broad light. Love your Father and never be ashamed of it. 18. Thy shepherds slumber. Do you know who the shepherds are? The shepherds are supposed to be the ones that are caring for the flock. They're supposed to feed the flock. And in the spiritual sense, in this generation, a true shepherd feeds with what? The famine, as you learned in Amos chapter 8, what was it, verse 13, is not for bread, but for hearing the word of God. 
as it's written in the simplicity in which Christ himself taught it. He said, your shepherds are asleep. Do you know why they're asleep? Have you ever read Romans chapter 11? For those that just drifted and drifted, God sent them the spirit of slumber. Kind of a shame, isn't it? Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. They're, they're going to they're be ashamed. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There's no leader out there. There's no, you know, uh, probably the greatest harm that can come to God's house is when you do not have a leader that insists on discipline. There is no discipline in the church because the hierarchy says, oh, dear God, don't make any waves. Uh, let's just, let's, it, it will cost us money and offerings. If, if you say anything controversial, they'll run, they'll leave. That's wrong. There is not, every child appreciates discipline from their parents. That's what brings forth love. A, parent, a, a child loves discipline because it lets the child know that the parent loves it and wants to, loves him or her because it, this is the way love comes forth. Called tough love sometimes, could be. But how many churches do you know that are really disciplined and focused on the Word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse? Hey, there's really a sad hunger in the nation. And do you know, do you know what is taught in seminaries? Is you can't hold a crowd just by teaching chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And my friend, you are looking at an example that would contradict that. As a matter of fact, I'm not hard up for students at all. I really have more students than than uh, most pastors could take care of. It's, it's no step for me because God always sends wonderful people to see that it gets done. But simply by teaching the truth, that's what they want to hear because truth sets you free. And God only knows never was there a time in history that people wanted to be set free from the no-nos of mankind in this church system. No, no. The truth of God sets you free in that sense whereby you can breathe and know that God loves us with discipline. Your preachers are asleep. That's what God says. Verse 19, there is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. It's going to be the deadly wound. You got it? Do I have to tell you? I don't think I do. It's Revelation chapter 13. We're talking about the deadly wound of the end times. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap the hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? In other words, God's election are going to clap their hands on him, all right, with joy. Into the pit. It's going to happen. Hey, that is a fantastic book, giving you the deadly wound, how it happens. Nations involved, basically, as a likeness and a type. How precious our Father is to us that he reveals these truths through his prophets, whereby you can be... Uh, privy to that information. Is it hidden? Yeah, in a way, it's hidden from those that are too ignorant to study. That is to say, they're biblically illiterate. Naturally, it's hidden from them because those set of prophets, that is the set of instructions that God sent along with these flesh bodies telling you how to preserve them eternally. He didn't send some man out here blowing off hot air with traditions of men. He sent you personally the word because he loves you personally. 
So see that you stay in that word and listen to it. You want to know about the deadly wound? You just did. Exactly as we lead up to it with the deception of all those that will be deceived and what will happen to their shepherds, preachers, ministers if they're not careful. I don't know. Does that happen to yours? Well, I don't know. You'll have to be the judge because I'm not going to judge anyone. I just teach God's word and let those chips fall wherever they may because they always heal. They heal those that would be involved with the deadly wound. They heal many that will participate in the deadly wound. All right, bless your hearts. Start a new book next lecture. Don't miss it. Listen a moment, won't you please?